Good afternoon. Welcome to this second afternoon panel session. And uh, the theme of the, of the panel session is uh, you will hack. I assume most of the organizations were hacked, uh, large or small. And, uh, know what? By, by, by the way, my name is Graham Rahm. I work in MIT Office of Corporate Relations. Now I will introduce the, the, start button. the moderator of this panel, Kerry Pearson. Kerry is, is the executive director of MIT Interdisciplinary Consortium on Improving Critical Cybersecurity Infrastructure. Uh, she will introduce the, the, the panelists. Let's welcome the panels. Thank you. Thank you. Can you guys hear me okay? All right, great. So um, I'm Dr. Carrie Pearlson. I'm the new executive director for the IC Cubed, which is a cybersecurity consortium out of the Sloan School of Management. Uh, we have two panelists who didn't join us today. One had a family emergency. The other one may just be wandering around MIT. So um, <laughs> we're kind of hoping that he gets here soon. Um, but I'm really excited to introduce the two folks that are here to join us. Um, very distinguished panel, and we're going to have a great discussion today about uh, you've been hacked, now what? So um, our plan is to have each of my panelists introduce themselves, talk a little bit about their background, and then share some stories about when they've been involved in uh, incidences and what they did about it. And then I have a few questions for them to generate some discussion, and then we'll open it up to you. And we've decided, because we're such a small group today, we're not going to use the online question and answer or the question submission. So just keep your questions, uh, and then we'll, we'll pass the microphone around and get a chance for you to um, ask us questions directly. But before we start, let's get a sense of who you are. So how many of you, I'm going to ask you if you're in security, if you're a CIO, if you're a, a vendor, um, and some other categories. So you might fall into multiple categories, but it's helpful for us to kind of know who, who's here today with us. So um, how many of you are a CIO or a, an IT leader of some sort? OK, how many of you are the uh, security, the CISO or the head of security for your company also? OK, great. Um, how many of you are consultants in the security space or the IT space? Anybody? A few? OK. How many of you are vendors of maybe security or some other kind of security uh, technologies? Great. And uh, students, any students or just general interested in this topic but not really connected in in any way professionally yet? A few? Press, okay, a few press. Anybody who didn't get to raise your hand? <laughs> All right, cool. So that's helpful to us just to have a sense of who's here and, uh, and what your background is. That, that helps us a lot. Okay, so um, Andrew, you want to start? Introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about um, your environment, where you, what, what you do at Philips, and when an incident when you've been hacked or when you've worked with a company that's been hacked. So uh, Andrew Stanley, I'm the Chief Information Security Officer for Philips. We're actually based in Amsterdam, 130,000 employees worldwide, functioning in 120 countries, including ones Americans are not allowed to know about. Uh, we, uh, we have a pretty diverse portfolio. We actually are in the process of moving out our lighting business, which is about uh, 40,000 employees, and retaining my side, which would be healthcare only. So healthcare is a, uh, a broad market for us. We start with the toothbrush in uh, your bathroom, and we're going to move all the way over to the uh, uh, CAT scanner and MRI machine that uh, your clinician sends to you when you come into the emergency room. So we have a number of lines of businesses, all of which have uh, security challenges. Uh, there's a security challenge for our IoT-enabled uh, toothbrush. A new product uh, tells you how your brushing patterns go. If you need to spend more time on these molars, check it out. My equity needs it. Uh, <laughs> Then as we move up the portfolio, we have products that are built to improve your life but also communicate with you. So uh, the challenge or the opportunity that that brings is as a patient, you have great communication with your clinician. However, that communication is intimate. Our healthcare information is the most intimate data we have in our lives. It would hurt if you knew what your bank account, if you knew what your bank account was. It may hurt if people saw what you were talking about with your attorney. But if someone knows a, a disease or healthcare challenge you have, a mental illness, behavioral challenge, uh, even eczema, uh, you don't want people to know that. You don't want to share that. Uh, 
So that creates uh, a really powerful security mandate, but also really powerful and uh, sometimes scary security challenge. Now, I'm only going to talk about an incident that was publicly disclosed. Uh, if we get to comments that are uh, not related to or related to a non-public uh, incident, I'll have to uh, refer the question to later. So just to set some uh, some ground rules. But uh, I'll use a, uh, a very public incident that happened in the EU. We had uh, the payroll data for about 4,000 employees leaked. And uh, the root cause of it was ultimately a downstream processor. So in payroll, you generate your own internal information, you ship it down to a firm like ADP who prepares it, and then ADP usually outsources it to a third party to print checks and reconcile it so there's a, a nice stream. And the reconciler had the breach. The problem was it had Philips' name on it. These are Philips employees. Uh, in the uh, EU, as the data controller, which is a, a strict concept, we were the ones who were on the hook with the Dutch government and with individual employees. So what made that breach a challenge, I was going to say interesting, but the press is here. Uh, <laughs> the, what made that a challenge is how do you know what the breach was, how do you know where it happened, but only know so much that you're not legally involving yourself and intertwining yourself with the investigation of that breach. Uh, it was important to us to know the how and the why because are we, Philips, being targeted? Are they going after Philips employees? Are they targeting the Netherlands only? Are they targeting a certain cohort of employees? Uh, the other uh, why that we want to know is, is there a larger payroll issue we have to be worried about worldwide? Is there a sustained campaign that either an ADP is going through that we're just finding out because we discovered it on Pastebin. Our security operations center was scanning Pastebin and found this. Uh, it was never disclosed to us by uh, the processor. We told the processor that they were the ones who suffered the breach. So we, uh, as we discovered it, uh, I was in my truck in northern Maine when I got a phone call. We immediately formed what we call a crisis team. We took an initial analysis of the data had a SOC analyst quickly dump through it and say, how many people? What's the nature of the information and how private is it? Justification, you saw paycheck, bank, uh, bank ID, uh, universal identification. In the Netherlands, that's your driver's license and your passport. So now you have something that's uh, really sensitive. We had uh, uh, your home address, uh, and we had other pertinent information that could be used to relatively uh, quickly steal your identity. To, to get a fake passport with it would have been an hour's worth of work if you had the data. Just very easy to exploit with the level of information you had. So we formed our crisis team. We uh, got legal involved immediately to go through our notification process. We knew that we had to notify the Data Protection Authority, which is the legal entity in a country that handles a loss of information under European privacy law, which is about to be replaced with something called a GDPR. So, we're getting ready for that. We have 72 hours to pull that off. But in that disclosure, we have to give them enough detail about what we know and what we're doing. Well, we don't know what we're doing because it's not my breach. It's, it's happened somewhere else, but it's my information. So we formed an investigation team that went after Pastebin, went after uh, a number of search engines that automatically search them, DuckDuckGo, uh, Yandex, Yahoo, Google, uh, et cetera. So we're filing takedown notices with them as rapidly as possible. Our SOC analysts are doing network scans to find out, could this data have been inside? So do we see lateral data movement and this could have leaked out the wrong way? Do we see uh, any attempts against our existing payroll system. We use Workday, so we have to call up Workday and say, Workday, do you see anything? If you do, uh, where is it targeted? Is Workday or ADP, are they gonna even wanna tell me that? That created a whole separate challenge. She got legal involved doing that analysis. And then we had our penetration testing team coming up with ideas for how this could have happened. Knowing what the technology was, knowing who, the, uh, who was doing the work, what are the potential entry points so we can catalog them and then again go back across our networks? It was about a month long process because we had to notify the authorities. We, uh, on day four, formed employee uh, events where we had attorneys, technical representatives, and HR representatives sitting up in a panel like this, fill the room with employees. They were all people who were hit and it was, we're here to talk. We're here to answer your questions. Uh, from a security perspective, that made life difficult because now I have to tailor the message. 
what did I tell the data protection authority? What am I talking about with my vendors? And what did I talk about with my employees? I didn't censor or hide information. I just did what I was legally bound to do, so I didn't get outside of that, where the company is now exposed to additional legal exposure. I'm a CISO. I started out as a software engineer writing device drivers for operating systems. Uh, I am not an attorney. I do not do well. I'm, I'm lucky I can speak English, for God's <laughs> sakes. Uh, but uh, uh, I had to sit there in the middle of it and be making those judgments with three different attorneys talking to me in three different countries. So who, is, who am I going to listen to? What judgment am I going to make? That process went on, and thankfully, we came out the other side pretty clean. Uh, we had to pay a small amount of money to the individual employees to cover credit and identity, but that downstream processor, we were able to conclusively prove, that's you. And you're going to take care of it, and if you don't take care of it, things will become very, very bad for you very quickly. So it worked out to our advantage, but it was a very, very hard month. So that's it. I'll move on. Great. Thank you. So let me let James introduce himself, and then we'll jump into dialogue. So you want to introduce yourself and talk a little bit about an experience you had? Or Certainly. Uh, James Lugaville. I'm a director in the Information Security Organization with ADP, as was mentioned before. <coughs> um, it's my role within ADP, you know, we pay well processing, human resource management, that sort of thing. We pay one in six Americans, you know, transfer trillions of funds every quarter. Um, uh, no, we're not involved in that, in that uh, <laughs> incident he's referring to by any stretch of the imagination, luckily. I'm not, uh, again, I, I am not in an IR role anymore. I'm actually on, on the business operations side where I get to see everything that goes on within the organization. So I, I handle the operations side. So, and, and I have a counterpart within, within my team that is actually handling kind of the executive briefing side of the house and reporting side. Um, we're, we're called ex execution assurance. So any lawyers or, or other HR folks in the in the audience here ought to love that title. But um, I'm here to talk about a previous role. Uh, when we talk about incidents, I ran a global uh, incident response team for a Fortune 150 that uh, was had a very public breach um, that uh, was nation state. It was a very coordinated, very sophisticated attack. Um, back in 2011 that uh, really, um, if you think about it, started off uh, very simply through a phishing email, right? We, you talk about uh, records, uh, health records and, and payment and payroll records and personal information. We were up against an adversary that it was uh, looking for intellectual property. And um, it, was, it was amazing to, to see um, the, from an adversarial perspective, I'm an operations guy, so as I said, I was down in the trenches. I was that analyst that was reporting up to the CISO. I was, unfortunately, I didn't get to go anywhere either without an attorney um, mm -hmm. because it was, it, there was a lot of work going on and with, besides the attorneys and the federal government and people that were working with us um, to, to help us uh, identify the, the adversary. Um, it started off as, as benign as, as a phishing email, as I said. Um, it, you talk about a company of 50,000 where five people get an email. One person pulls it out of the junk mail uh, folder and, and opens it and exploits a zero day in, in ex, an Excel spreadsheet. And we're in the news because of that. Uh, from, 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 from an incident responder, you know, it, we, we get all excited uh, when we see things like that. I, I hate to say it. Um, the, our, our executive leadership doesn't get excited, but I will say that uh, our executive leadership was fantastic throughout the entire process. So there's, you know, having uh, leadership support, they weren't after heads. They weren't trying to just bury us with, with, from, from an information perspective. They were very open, supporting, gave us what we needed. And that allowed us to, to track this adversary and do what was necessary in order to eradicate it. Um, I, you know, it, if we looked at how, you know, what came out of that for us, I mean, I'm not going to get into details about, you know, how we, how we were able to identify the adversary, how we were able to quickly uh, uh, quarantine the, the adversary and, and ultimately, you know, remove them from the network. What I wanted to talk about was what came out of that, right? What did we learn from this is that we really stepped back and look at our, looked at ourselves and said, what are we doing? Um, we, we do, everything was out on the table, you know, let's, let's go back to the whole people process and technology thing. We started to look at, okay, what do we have from a network segmentation? Do we have the right segmentation of our infrastructure that could have limited an adversary from moving around laterally? 
You know, what are we doing from a, a, an administrative privilege management? You know, how are we managing those privileged administrator accounts that will allow somebody to quickly manipulate and maneuver around your network? And, you know, to, to, see, the, to see the adversary move and to, when I talk about sophisticated, you could see shift changes in, in the people that, you know exactly what I'm talking about. When they changed shift, the mission shifted as to what they were doing. Um, you could see the, the, you know, the command strings that were launched, the, what they were going after totally changed. But, you know, it, it, it allowed us to see what their intentions were. So when we talk about our help desk, what was our help desk doing when somebody would call up and, and identify themselves as James Lugabill? Were we asking the right questions? Were we giving them information? You know, just, it's something like that. But then also I had to step back and look at my organization and say, uh-oh. What did I have? What didn't I have? And how did I respond? And how could I have responded more effectively? Did I have the right people in the right places to do the right things at the right time? Did I have the right instrumentation in the environment to be able to identify this, to be able to track the activities, and to be able to uh, uh, remove them, as, as I said before? So that's really the message that I was trying to, try, trying to get. Okay, so um, before I jump into questions with our panelists, let me do another show of hands. Anybody in here know of a company, personally know of a company that's experienced a breach? Okay, anybody willing to raise their hand and say their company has experienced a breach? <laughs> okay, I realize we're filming this, so you may not want to admit that, but I, this is the old do you know somebody kind of question, because uh, many of us do, many of us have, been, have had first-hand or maybe second-hand experience. You Good. You probably ask that differently. How do you want to <laughs> How many don't know that they've been breached? <laughs> well, this is my next question. We, we have this, uh, yeah, we have this theory that it's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. So um, our panel is, is on the topic of you've been breached, now what? But the first, or you've been hacked, now what? And the first question when we were planning this panel was to talk about the difference in a hack and a breach. So James, do you want to talk about that? Because that was something you felt oh, sure. there was... Sorry, <laughs> you felt there was some difference in the in you know the the the, the terminology, and well, just so that we're all on the same page about I, that. I, there is a difference in in from 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 my side. I mean, it may be splitting hairs, right? I, I think that there there's there's hacks every day that you get compromised. There's a host that gets compromised, and however, the adversary isn't looking to to breach your infrastructure to remove data, right? I, I you, you can see that a lot, right? I you could. You could almost think that you're being hacked when you just talk about simple pieces of malware that are, are, are installed from a browser perspective. They're not actually looking for personal information or they're not looking for per, uh, um, um, intellectual property. It, 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 I think breaches are where you've identified that there is information that has, you have lost control of from a malicious adversary. We lose information all the time. Not ADP, I'm not talking about that. But, um, you know, you, you have that situation where you, you do have hacks, but it's not necessarily a breach of the information that requires disclosure. So I, I absolutely agree, and I don't think it's splitting hairs because hacking is an action, breach is an outcome. And uh, you talked about the shift change piece. That's important knowledge to have to understand what could happen in the future or what the intent was before the information walked out the door. Uh, it's easy to talk about a breach because it's very easy to put in context. Payroll data walked out the door. A hack is harder to put in context uh, because you start getting into, well, what was their intent? Well, it was just phishing. It, you know, all these things that seem insignificant. But to us, we realize just how close to the, uh, uh, how close to the void we came. We looked down there and said, oh, my God, we nearly lost that. Uh, and we, I think we spend more time on the hack, at least I do, than the breach. Uh, I worry about the breach. The breach may drive my behavior and how I build systems and protect myself, but I want to know about the hack. I want to know about how they do it, when they did it, where they're doing it, because that's what's going to matter to the executives. They're going to want to know, well, why did this happen to me? You know, why did that malware work here? And that, that question came up more often in my last incident that we just discussed than the nature of the breach. A lot of times, the difference between the, the hack and the breach is the time to respond. Yeah. Right? How quickly can you, uh, you know, deploy your resources, get, get everything in place in order to, to stop that from taking the next yeah. jump in the chasm, if you will. 
Absolutely. So um, all of us have heard about WannaCry, the uh, ransomware that just happened a few weeks ago. Um, and maybe some of your companies or some of your friends' companies uh, were impacted by that. It's something like 200,000 companies around the world uh, were impacted by that. Something like 150 companies around the world were impacted. Um, but, and so it's pretty clear when there's a ransomware situation and your data is locked up that something's happened. But if it's not that kind of situation, and maybe we're talking about the kind of incidences that you two described earlier, how do you know? How do you know that there's been a hack or a breach? How do you know? And, um, when, when do you know? How do you, how do you follow that? I mean, that's a... Uh, it can start at the That's help the desk. Question. Yeah, it is. Yes. Well, it can start at the help desk. You know, my machine is messed up. It's got this funny image on it. Uh, all the way through, uh, some of our sensor systems pick up something that doesn't look right. Uh, for most advanced companies, you're going to pick up the majority of actual hacks to intent someone actually touching the keyboard and going in with your detection investment, but your breach point is overwhelmingly email-based today. For most incidents, the really nasty ones don't use email. Uh, but it will come in via email. Someone will do something silly. They'll click a link. They'll fall for a trap. And then you hear about it through uh, the wrong channels. We actually place a huge investment in phishing campaigns, sending out a phishing campaign, getting people to click the link, and then say, hey, you clicked the link. You should have checked twice. Here are the ways you could have identified this as a phishing email. There's actually a very large oil company, uh, one of the largest in the world, that's a three-strike rule. They send you phishing emails on a regular basis. First time you click the link, your internet access is revoked for a week. Second time you do it, your internet access is revoked for a month. Third time you do it, your internet access is revoked permanently, and it negatively impacts your performance score for that year. Zero sum. And that's meant to uh, eliminate the click-through. But all it takes is five in the company, one click it, and you make it through. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, early warning, uh, as much as you can, you know, from an instrumentation around the organization. Um, I, it, the, the worst case scenario is the federal government gives you a call and, and tells you, hey, guess what? We found your data sitting, you know, in XYZ. We've been just searching the dark web, and guess what we just saw? You know, there's 100,000 patient records or 100,000 payroll records or, you know, uh, you name it. Here's your, you know, the, the industrial designs for your next missile system. Um, that, that's, that's a worst case scenario, and I say that because usually they're three months late. Um, and that doesn't, it doesn't really help you from uh, your ability to respond and contain and identify potential other threats into your organization and, and be able to manage it effectively. Um, so th again, from a help desk, uh, your administrators, I love training. Um, you know, uh, one of our uh, key strategic pillars within our security organization is to foster a security conscious culture. Um, and we try to drive that in every opportunity we can within our brand image. It's one of ADP's brand uh, pillars as well. And so, you know, these are the types of things that, you know, identifying it quickly and having the right uh, people to execute on it. Yeah. So the other question we talked about um, us discussing first before we open it up to the audience is, what are you going to do? What do you do? What's the first thing you do when you find out there's been a problem? I mean, who do you call? Who don't you call? What, what is your response? James, you want to start I, I mean, us out? I was going to, my first call uh, from an operations perspective, because I'm generally the guy that's finding it, right? Somebody's calling me to tell me that, 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 some, that something happened for my teams wherever they were around the globe. And my first call is obviously to the CISO, right? All right, here's what we have, you know, and it's, it's almost like a disaster scenario that you see play out in the news, right? And it's unfortunate, but it, it, it takes a lot of patience and, and, and willpower and confidence in your program to, to not react too quickly. Because a lot of times the information that I'm going to bring my CISO is not going to be complete. So to take action on that would be devastating. And, you know, so, that, that's really the big thing for me is to, to um, contact my CISO, organize the team, structure how you're going to respond, and get everybody staged, right? Um, you have an incident response plan. You execute on that immediately. The CISO, I'll let him get into the next level of communications, right, and how the cadence will work and how you start to do all that. I mean, I, one of the things that we did learn in, in the number of incidents that we always had was they want information way too often. It's not necessarily him, but his 
leadership, right? Whether it's the CIO, the CFO, or directly to the CEO or the board. They want information every hour. And this is not a sprint, it's a marathon. Mm -hmm. and, and you have to work together to back them off so that way they understand that information is gonna come in, you need to give us some time, we need to analyze this data so we're not reacting to information that is inaccurate or incomplete. So, so uh, from my perspective, when I get the phone call, I'm gonna ask uh, three questions. Who's the duty officer? Because whoever was running the security operations center that discovered it is now in command of that incident, and I'm the one who's working with them to support them, and I'm a communications channel and sometimes a decision channel, but I wanna empower them to do it because you know they're, they're closest to the incident. I want the duty officer on the phone, the head of operations, and the head of intelligence. Uh, and then later we bring, we have two types of intelligence, technical and strategic. And the, I want the tech intel guys on the phone. And I wanna ask where, what can we do, and why. The reason why I wanna know why is I wanna be able to send a statement upstairs uh, to my leadership that here's what we've been able to do, here's what we're working on, and here's what we think the intent is. We want senior leadership to have context around the intent because that will drive a lot of decisions coming later. Do you bring law enforcement in? Do you have to notify the government? Do you have to notify employees, customers, regulators, on and on and on from there? So that why is a very important thing for me to establish early and make it an ongoing dialogue. Once I have a rough idea of that, I have to make a judgment call. Uh, there are some situations that are very cut and dry. I'm going to form a crisis team. We're going to, so we have a very strict protocol uh, for crisis. We're going to run the crisis. We're going to go through that whole process and make sure stakeholders are communicated with in a strict and uh, rigid manner. And then they can call me if they have questions. But this is your cadence, guys. You really need to give us the, the marathon uh, statement before. He's spot on with that. If it's not that level, I will sit there and say to myself, is this something the board needs to know about? If it's something that, that I think the board needs to know about, then the CEO has to know immediately. Uh, if I don't think it's something that the board needs to know about, then I need to make sure the COO knows immediately so they can engage in judgment calls as necessary. So I have to tune that message. I have to make some judgment if I don't think it crosses the crisis threshold uh, and then manage it from there. What's important for me now is now to create the document trail. If uh, I want to show that we've been asking these questions all along, that we've been tracking them, and if we see the incident escalate in scope, that we were then able to go and say, we've been tracking this. We did not consider it a significant event, however we did. I mean, we have 130,000 people. We get tens of thousands of phishing reports a month, and you're going to get a lot of people who are going to click the link. And how many of those people really did something that needs to run up the stairs? If it's just a password switch and their machine checks clean, I don't need to say something. Uh, but I may need to see something if I see a pattern there. If I see everyone in research in Haifa, Israel, getting the same email at the same time of day, uh, and it's targeted to the same cohort of people. If I see that, I may not have a breach, but I have an attack. And now that's got to go upstairs because what do they want in Haifa? I know what they make in Haifa. You know, let's, let's go on and take a, a step from there. So that's how I work it. I get caught in the middle a lot and I force my operations guys to be the ones who lead it because if they can't lead it, I can't step in and do that. If I step in and lead it, bad decisions are going to be made every single time. It's interesting when you, when you said the Haifa thing, knowing your business and knowing what's, what's being done in the lines of business where is, is absolutely critical to a response capability. Not understanding what your business does in a specific location, your response could basically devastate your organization. So under, knowing that and driving that, you know, not just from the CISO, but all the way down to your operations team, they need to know the business and need to know it well. All their, not all their processes, but they need to understand functional processes so they can effectively uh, respond. Yeah, that's one of my, if you look at staffing investments, that's one of my highest cost investments. We have our tactical or technical intelligence team, which is able to look at trends in different phishing attempts and try and correlate that to a particular attacker uh, or actor. And then we have our strategic intel team that's trying to figure out why. What does this business do? Where do they do it out of? What assets do they have? 
uh, and we do it through counterintelligence. We literally hire ex counterintel officers. They go talk with a research executive and say, you know, what are you guys investing in right now? Okay, and then we send those people out to a site, introduce myself, hey, I'm Andrew Stanley. You know, what are you working on right now? Oh, you're working on Zigbee for the next lights. That's really cool, you know, why do we do that? Start picking up a lot of information really quick, and now when I form an incident, I know this is what's happening there, this is why it's important, and we can place that into context, and we can do so in a pretty absolute manner, uh, which helps out with a lot of things, especially if law enforcement gets involved especially if law enforcement gets involved. <laughs> so that raises the question about, I mean, we talk about internal response, the team you pull together, whether you kick the, the incident upstairs, how, what resources you pull together, when and why would you bring in law enforcement or your insurance company or some external entity? Where, where does that play into the process? Law enforcement and insurance are two very different things. Yeah, of course. Very, very, very different things. Insurance is when things are gonna get really nasty and ugly. That's when lawsuits are coming along, reputational risk is coming along, mandatory disclosures to financial entities. That's when you need insurance on your side. Uh, and every policy will usually have a mandated disclosure uh, uh, rider that says this is what you need to do and when. From a law enforcement perspective, it varies country to country, and it varies actor to actor, and it varies intent to intent. The reason why you have that complicated matrix is there are certain state actors that um, my relationships with law enforcement said, if these people come knocking, we really need to know. This is something that's important. We make a judgment call and say, yeah, we'll share that. And we'll share it what we call a trust basis, which is, it's not an investigation. We'll say, hey, we saw this. Uh, then we have ones that we show that's material financial harm. Yeah. Money, a lot of money is walking out the door. You need law enforcement, you need prosecutorial support. Uh, the last one is when uh, material harm, when someone's trying to use your systems to either destroy the company or destroy something else, that's a do not pass go. I'm calling law enforcement before I even, uh, to use the problem, kick it upstairs. Engaging law enforcement is sticky. Executives don't like it. They really don't like it uh, because it becomes a matter of public record in a lot of countries. Uh, and they don't like talking about with prosecutors and legal uh, and law enforcement a topic they don't really understand. Having your CEO be interviewed about a cyber breach is not, <laughs> not a position. You, be. <laughs> you do not want to be there. Uh, so it also comes down to your relationship with law enforcement. We purposefully cultivate relationships with law enforcement officials in critical countries in critical areas. Maintain that relationship, know them, occasionally talk about different concepts and things, and just so you know, when you call, I'm going to get Carrie Pearson on the phone, and I can trust her, and I know I can work through a relationship with her. That's our approach. I'm not sure how I you mean, guys... I mean, there's uh, hardly anything to add with that from, because, I mean, you covered a, a lot related to, you know, from the law enforcement side for us, um, it's, you know, when you talk about money movement and you see things like that, there, there's, as you said, financial impact. We get immediately call, uh, you know, the Secret Service or FBI, whomever would be, have jurisdiction on that. But from an operations perspective, Law enforcement is, is the worst from an intelligence perspective, uh, capacity. Um, they're, they're kind of a diode, right? When you're giving them information, they ain't coming back. Um, and, and a lot of times, you need you need uh, uh, you need snappy responses. You need uh, to have that data. You need to understand from a nation state what you potentially may be up against. However, they have everything's damn classified for those guys. Yeah. So. In a number of instances, you pass them information, they know exactly who it is, but you're not gonna get that response back because you generally know at that point that it's classified, so you're dealing with a nation state that has tools and tactics that, you know, if they disclose that, will adversarially affect our nation's you know, intelligence capabilities. So um, that, that, that from our, we're very cautious in, in how we deliver that, but also, you know, it does put you in that sticky situation for when you do provide something. Now it's, you know, public record and you can start to have things disclosed that you might not have normally disclosed yeah. otherwise. So that, that raises another question, though. I mean, when you guys described the stories initially, James, yours was a nation state actor. And Andrew, yours was, I, I, you didn't say who it was, but it was about stealing uh, uh, personal data and, 
and uh, so maybe not a, a nation state. It wasn't about the IP, it was about personal data. Does that change how you use the external resources? Because one of the things we talked about on the phone also, just for full disclosure, was once you bring in the authorities, you can lose the, 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 the bad guys go underground. I mean, they can tell when certain people come into the system and then you might lose the opportunity to even track who they are, figure out what's going on. So, you know, the question in my mind is, depending on what's being stolen, breached, um, you know, affected, does that change how you would interact with authorities? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, it's actually inverse. If you're looking for money, I'm more likely to call up FBI, Secret Service, or an external entity uh, in the EU if that's where it's happening. If it's nation state now, I now have to make judgments. If it's related to something that's an export controlled technology, so it's a dual use military technology, then yeah, enforcement yeah. has to get involved. If it's something that's personal and private to the company but doesn't represent an existential risk, you know, I don't have to report it. I don't report every laptop theft that comes in the company when someone steals a laptop and walks out the door. I uh, wait until there's enough of them. And with the nation states, getting involved in law enforcement on that, to, you made an excellent point, everything is damn classified. Uh, I mean, I'm surprised they don't classify their breathing patterns in the morning. <laughs> and it's not negative towards them, they have reasons for it, and we've built a culture in law enforcement over the last 15 years that everything is sacred. Uh, I want to just touch on a point before. When dealing with law enforcement, you have to make the judgment, is this going to adversely affect the privacy of individuals? Uh, I have a very strong, I come from a kind of a crypto kitty background, you know, 20, 25 years ago. It's important to me that we do not use corporations as an extension of the nation state. So it, that has to be a part of my judgment. I don't think I'm in the majority of CISOs in that thinking, but you don't want to be in a position where you're just an arm of a government entity. It hurts your competition in other countries. If you're open with the government here in the US, your Chinese competition is gonna have an advantage on you because you're gonna be pushed away. No, 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 we don't wanna do business with you. At the same time, you're enabling something that you're a private corporation. You have no business being involved in that. So I'll yeah, get off my, my pedestal for that. James, anything to add? I mean, it, it certainly affects, right, what we're, it, if you think of uh, from an intellectual property uh, perspective, we we always looked at it more of how exactly right did it does it have an effect uh, on a on a more global scale right can we can control what this is and how what it means to a national security type incident or uh, again when you're talking about uh, human resource and in our uh, personal information then yeah I mean you, we don't take that lightly because one. Our, our reputation is everything from an ADP yeah. perspective. So we will involve them immediately because they have the masses of resources that can really drill down and, and, yeah. and help us. So one of the other topics we talked about, and we just hit a little bit on it here, was about insurance, cyber insurance. And uh, uh, at the consortium, one of our research projects is looking into what is cyber insurance, how do you measure risk, how do you think about what do you insure. And one of the things that I found interesting in our discussion was the fact that, uh, first of all, insurance isn't necessarily what you think it is. It's not covering every aspect of a potential uh, loss or breach that when, when there's a breach. So I'd like to hear your comments on that. But second of all, the, thing, the other piece that might be of interest to our IT audience is the ecosystem the insurance companies have that have resources to help you recover from a potential uh, breach, you know, not necessarily the insurance company themselves, but the ecosystem in which they work. They have um, uh, forensics teams uh, or companies they work with. They they know may know law enforcement differently than you do. So, could you comment on the role of cyber insurance and uh, you know how these guys should be thinking about it in terms of preparing themselves should there be a breach, how to recover using insurance? Well, my old CISO used to say, "Your mileage may vary," um, <laughs> and I really. It, it does when, you know, when it comes to insurance. And I think it's still in its infancy, right? From a cyber perspective, they've obviously been doing insurance claiming, you know, and adjustments for hundreds, a hundred and some odd years. But um, from a cyber perspective, I think it's still, we're still learning and there's not a lot of data yet to support, you know, what that's, what that's going to look like. Um, I, I, I know that there's a lot of riders and things that require you to engage with X vendor from a forensics perspective. You must contact 
th this other uh, uh, investigatory or analysis firm to do this. You must work with these communications uh, uh, structures to, to get you know, PR messaging out. Um, I, I just really have not um, seen or uh, had a lot of interaction when it comes to actually um, you know, dealing with the claims at that point. So. Yeah, I, uh, I actually just spoke in front of 82 insurance brokers and representatives as we're rebidding our insurance. Uh, and it is, the, the quality of the questions are improving over time. So they're very good at asking questions. The output and outcome, I don't think the insurance companies are there yet. Uh, I think part of it is because they haven't had a loss. You know, they, they haven't had a massive loss that helps them calibrate their thinking. They do, they do know how to in, uh, uh, intercede. They know that they want this vendor that does this uh, critical response. But now the challenge is you have someone who's talking to two people, not one. And do you, are you ready to be in that position? Uh, I don't think, maybe ADP is different, but I think very few CISOs would pull the insurance lever until things were really nasty. It just, it's not, you know, it's well, not. Uh, also, well, the way I understand it too, there's a lot of time, right? You have to be within, mm -hmm. you, once you know, you need to formulate whether or not you're gonna contact the insurance you know, company at a specific point. You, you know, once, you're, once you've you know, exceeded that time, then you, you're, I mean, you're on your own. But um, yeah, I, it, I, I can't speak for ADP yeah. on that one. Yeah. All right, so we have about 15 minutes left. Who has a question for us? Yes, sir. So you were talking about the relationships that you guys build internally and externally. And when it comes to a, a, a hack, right, people need to know their roles and responsibilities. Do you practice this? Do you go through, you know, like all our kids are doing shelter in place kind of stuff now, in case anything ever thought of this happened? Are you doing that? And so everybody knows their whole So this is the question, just because I have the microphone for the, the recording. Your question is, is there, are you practicing the response, your, your plan? Are you practicing so people know ahead of time what their roles are and what, their need, what they need to do? Yeah, do you guys practice? Do your teams practice? What's an example? What do you practice? So we do tabletop exercises. Uh, they vary from very simplistic incidents that are just a bunch of alerts went off in the SOC. How did you respond to it? Security Operations Center, uh, sorry. Uh, all the way up to full-blown crisis. We do full, a full-blown crisis four times a year on a quarterly basis. And uh, we bring in an outside firm to do the tabletop, and that helps us, it's, yeah, it's role play, but it, it does help us out a lot. Uh, and it helps us just sort of keep our thinking tuned. Then we do have penetration testing. So penetration testing forces you to be a little more real-time in certain types of pen tests where they're actually looking to test your detection systems and see what you can and can't pick up. Uh, so all of those uh, help, but at the same time, you can't overburden your people with, uh, with tabletops. There's a gentleman back here. I called him up my previous meeting, um, Michael Coden, back there from Boston Consulting. They do it at the board level. So they run tabletops just for board members, uh, and that's a really useful tool because it helps us when we have to phone upstairs. The board already gets what the response cycle's like. So from, from our perspective, yeah, certainly, uh, uh, you know, practicing, I used to, I, there's this practice makes perfect. I don't agree with that. Perfect practice makes perfect. Because um, if you're doing it wrong in practice, you're going to continue to do it wrong when it, yeah. when it hits the fan. So what's the point? But yeah, so ha having all of that defined and, and executing on that on a regular basis, right? From a security operations perspective, most people are like, we're doing this every day. We don't need practice, right? But th there is that point in which, right, when you talk about red team, when you, in, in starting to look at it from a threat modeling perspective, yeah. right? Mo you know, if you're threat modeling, you're starting to identify the ways in which adversaries are going to exploit and use your infrastructure, your applications, whatever that may be. So yeah, I, I completely agree with that. It, it goes without saying. I, I hate to say that, but um, you know, having the right uh, incident response plan, crisis management plan, you know, having the relationships again with the business already ongoing, um, your PR organization, your HR, your legal, um, those are the ones that you generally don't do this very often. So we'll have those, you know, quick tabletops. Hey, guess what? We just, you know, found out from X, Y, Z that a thousand identities were stolen. What are you going to do, you know, PR and legal and, and privacy? 
and you know have them have that plan executed. How many people in this room um, do these uh, exercises in your company or participate in these exercises? Okay, so it's, it's, it's about half. I see about half the hands. So thank you for your question. Who else has a question? Yes, sir. So as uh, more and more breaches are becoming uh, normal, people have realized that users are the weakest link in the chain, no matter how much you feed them training and all those things. So you talk about uh, phishing training and all those things. Is there anything else you can do for understanding the user behavior? From the uh, training for the future proofing your users, so other than training? We love that yeah. question because the consortium is all about that. That's exactly what our IC cubed consortium is about. We think that you know, the, you can put all of the technology in place that you want, but if you leave the keys under the mat or you put that sticky on your computer with your password, it doesn't matter how great your technology is, people can get through. So, so what else do you do to make sure, besides phishing exercises, what else can you do to future-proof your organization? Uh, tie their hands behind their backs? <laughs> um, well, I, wait, we can't do that. We can't do that. Uh, In some countries, you yeah. can. <laughs> And, and I, I agree with, with the education, right? You, you can only take that so far. And I think I'll, I'll kind of step back and say I think we've almost, in some instances from a security perspective, we've caused our users to, to do these things because we have not fostered an environment that allows them to get their work done in, in a manner that everybody is asking them to do. We've put controls in their way. They're very burdensome in some instances. And I just think that you know we need to make it simpler for the users. We can train them all we want. And, and having a discussion at lunch, we see more and more security professionals falling for phishing emails. Because to be honest with you, most people can't tell. I, I just, it, you know, it, it, ADP is one of the most leveraged domains to, to forge a domain besides UPS, ADP, you know, you, you know, how many people you guys get the email saying your package was delivered or can't be delivered, right? Um, that sort of thing. So it, 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 they're, they're getting more and more sophisticated, more and more challenging to do that. So we have to figure out other ways to, to help guide the users through that. And I don't think it's a matter of, hey, do, you know, don't click on this. We just need to encourage them to report it. I don't care whether it turns out to be nothing, whether it's really a subscription that you dropped your business card into a jar at a conference and they're really just hammering away at you to try and sell you something you don't need anyway. But for the vendors in the room, sorry about that. Um, <laughs> but, don't put that in the you, you know, the, the point is is that you know, we, we just need to make it easier for the users mm -hmm. and, and more tra transparent, if you will. One of the topics we're researching at the consortium is what we call house of security. It's about building a culture of cybersecurity. We have cultures of safety. You would never think to walk into a, a, a manufacturing facility and put your hands in the machine. You wear a hard hat if you're on a construction site. You hold a handrail if you're walking down uh, a, a steep flight of stairs. Um, but we don't have that same culture with security. And one of the things we're looking at is how do you build that? And what's the difference between the perception and the reality of a culture of cybersecurity. I think, I think one of the, and I'll let you go, is one of the references was around OSHA that we talked about in, yeah. the, in the IC3, right? That, you know, it, it takes a disaster for, for, for something to happen. I think we're several generations away from really having that, that type of culture, so. Yeah, I think that, uh, uh, first of all, we do highly targeted, remember I talked about Intel, counter Intel before. There are areas where we're going to get training and technical resources in front of you on a regular basis and humanize it. We have these concepts called roadshows. We have a security expert uh, we call a business partner, so slightly more generic. A lot of ex-sales uh, people who are looking to jump into cybersecurity. And an Intel person go out, they've got a presentation to talk about security, and then they make it a very human experience. We can only do that in 130,000 employees. You can't touch everyone, so you go to those, those high-risk areas. And I think that's, uh, that's vital and important. To um, James's point before, there was an attack that went out recently that was nasty. They took PayPal, the PayPal domain name, oh, yeah, and they took the A and they put a Turkish accent on it. So it's, uh, in the Turkish language, they have a little, uh, I can't remember what the name is, but a little accent that hangs on the bottom. And if you look at it on your screen, it looks like a little speck of dust on your laptop monitor because most people use a resolution that's small enough. And the campaign nailed a lot of people. So I was, uh, I got it and 
looked at it, and I didn't use anything with PayPal, and I was like, what is that? And I just happened to put my finger on my screen and it didn't move, and that's when it, the light went off. So there's a group of us who work with the FBI, and I took a screenshot of it and sent it out, and none of them picked up on it. Every single person said it was a legit email because that little itty bitty piece looked like just a little, little speck of dust. I was going to say, and how many users are actually going to, you know, open the email and look at the headers to find out what the, you know, what servers this thing traversed on its way to you? Yeah. Right? No, it's not going to do that, so. No, and it's, it gets back to the asymmetry of the problem, right? I think collectively between us, we have a few hundred employees that are focused on this, <laughs> but you have over 100,000 adversaries that are known, and that's just at the state actor and organized crime level. So it's so asymmetric, they're going to come up with attacks faster, so then it becomes about that focus stuff. If you're getting PayPal emails, if you're getting BNY Mellon emails, take a step back and say, did this come from the right person? Why am I getting it? Pick up the phone and call the person to verify. It's painful, and it is caused by, to the IT executives in here, 30 years of terrible IT investment in creating this Byzantine network of systems that are hard for people to use. And to secure them, you go through this, you know, this frightening framework of uh, controls to protect them. It makes it a terrible experience. Uh, and the incentives aren't there, and I think you're right. I think we're probably two or three generations away from people living a secure life, really, did every you have step. Did you about this topic? I did, actually. I want to kind of tag along uh, to something he had mentioned. Uh, we've gotten a little bit... Uh, Introduce yourself, so... Yeah, sure. Thank you. Yeah, my name is Trey Davis. I'm from the Lee County School District in Southwest Florida, and we've gotten uh, really creative with our CETA program. Uh, kind of started out in the information systems division as if you didn't have a clean desk, you know, you had to buy the entire division uh, donuts or bagels. <laughs> and and, and that, that worked pretty well. Then all of a sudden I worked with the other chiefs to make the same thing happen. So now just for example at our, our thousand person district headquarters, uh, now you hear everybody talking about I got to make sure I clean my desk because I don't want to have to buy the, uh, the donuts or the bagels the next morning you know, for that many people. So we're having to get a little bit creative. And I guess what I'm interested <coughs> about in an organization of your size is maybe you, if you could speak a little bit about uh, maybe a CETA program uh, that you have in place and also how does that relate to maybe issue specific security policies uh, that you may have also for users. What's the acronym again? Yeah, what's the acronym? Uh, CETA, uh, Security Education Training and Awareness. Oh, I wasn't thinking of it that way. Sorry about that. Yeah, <laughs> uh, yeah so for us, you know, clean desk policy and things like that work in research. Just people get it, but outside of research and cross cultures, it just doesn't. Uh, for example, in India, man, does it work well. Because a lot of people came through companies where if you didn't clean your desk at night, you were, you were fired because you were, you were dealing with so many customers. So that works really well there. In China, good luck. Peace be with you if you can do that. I mean, it's just, it's, it, it feels impossible sometimes. Thailand, same thing. So you end up getting involved in these cultural areas for you know, multinational our size that makes it really difficult. So then it comes down to, again, putting it in context. Uh, and that's where getting the face-to-face -face time and delivering that training works. Uh, and putting incentives on it. You know, it's, I, I like that big oil companies approach, man, I would love to do that. Not because I want to be draconian, but because it, it drives a message home pretty quick and pretty painfully, but. Uh, we, we do a lot. I mean, we actually have an entire organization devoted to awareness and training. As I said, <laughs> one, of the, one of the key st strategic uh, segments that we call it within the, the security organization is fostering a security conscious culture. So, it's whether we're building uh, training content for developers, secure training content for developers, whether we're participating in uh, uh, like capture the flags, we'll bring in students from all, all over uh, the area to do a capture the flag. The infosec team will set it up. You know, one guy will act as a hacker and, and be trying, you know, and, and, and be a red, a black hat, or you know, people will be on the blue teams. We do, uh, you know, simple awareness uh, campaigns for for folks. We'll We'll hand out things as simple as uh, the the little slides that cover your cam uh, cameras on your laptops, right? I, I just can't believe how much people eat those things up. Um, I, I think they're chewing them like bubble gum. Uh, but you know, doing things like that, and, and but also connecting a message to it, right? That you know, uh, just something simple that they can be doing, like the, like the camera uh, cover that we have on the back of it. It has you know ten easy steps for you to protect yourself you know, online, right? And, and when you bring it personal to, to, the, to the people, you know, uh, then it, it really starts to hit home with them. And, and what, what if they do it from a, a 
personal perspective at home, they're going to bring that, con that, that culture in, into work. Um, but yeah, we, we have uh, organizations, right? So we have a service delivery model, right, where we have a training and awareness organization, but we have the delivery of that training scattered all over the globe, right, on, on the several continents and dozens of countries that we're in, right? And so they'll have exorbitant, you know, efforts and pin the tail on the hacker and all these other things to, to all these different offices because in a 60,000, we're, you know, half the size of these guys, 60,000 person company, you can't hit everybody. So we're just trying to continually get that message out. We deliver, uh, we're very active on the social media from an intranet perspective, right? We'll, we'll make everybody aware of every campaign that people are using against ADP out there. So our client services team is well aware of what this email looks like, who it's coming from. So when somebody calls, they have access to that information. Uh, our, our CISO is constantly blogging, whether I, I like it or not, from, you know, <laughs> from my perspective. But you know, we're, we're just constantly doing those things and just trying. The idea that we're trying to do is make it personal, and, and w the training, the, the, actually at a senior director level, is our, is our training um, department, and she always is telling us, "Don't be dark and stormy. People tired of dark and stormy. Yeah. You know, stay away from that because you're just you're turning people off when you when you hear Wanna Cry on the NBC Nightly News." It's all dark and stormy. It's like, oh, I don't want to, we don't want, they don't want to see that anymore. So we have, this clock is actually wrong. We have about three minutes left. Oh, so I want to make sure that I give you guys a chance to give one piece of advice that our audience ought to do. Uh, again, our topic is you've been hacked, now what? So if you're thinking about uh, what they would do if, if and when they discover that, that something's happened, what's the one thing, one thing you want them to leave with, one message you want them to leave with today? I get to go. I get to go first. Um, so, I dropped out the uh, perfect practice makes perfect. So I'm going to drop a lot of p words here. They're better than f words, by the way. <laughs> um, so, I, I, another thing I grew up with was the seven p's. Right? Prior proper planning prevents piss poor performance, and I instill that in all of my teams that I've, I've ever I've ever run. And it, it really, for me, that's the message I want to get. You know, plan properly, execute. And, and, and really, that's all. It's going to happen if it hasn't happened already. Um, you're going to be in this situation very soon. So Great. seven Ps. Seven Ps. I'm glad we recorded that so we can go back and get that slowly. <laughs> <I'll say> slowly. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Uh, so for me, it's get to know the why. Really, put that effort in, even if it takes you six hours try and find the why because as soon as you start bringing in a larger group of stakeholders or you start considering your response that why is going to be probably the most significant piece that you deal with because it's going to help you prevent it in the future it's going to help you know is it still going on especially if it's a state actor you may contain one unit but they could have five other units in there with completely different uh yeah ttps <laughs> i know yes. i can't say that um uh but it, different of behaviors and that you don't know it but if you know the why you can say let's go down here is there anything anomalous looking around here and uh, be prepared to communicate as in the shortest sentences possible <laughs> right I'm talking 12 word sentences three sentence emails keep it simple stupid it's really easy to go nuts and start explaining the minutia of what's going on keep it keep it simple and, and practice I would just it. Add, um, your call to action when you go back to your office tomorrow, take a look at your culture and see what you can do to start to build a culture of security. So that would be a call to action that I would recommend you do. All right, we'll give it up for my panelists. Thank you very much. It's great. Um, I believe there's, well, let me turn it back over to Graham. I don't know where you go next. Yeah, um, excellent uh, panel discussion. Thank you very much. And enjoy the rest of the event here.